I don't like to do things that everybody else is doing. It's not, you know, about doing fads or doing things differently. It's about, for me, I, I thought to myself, what did they do a hundred years ago, 200 years ago? And this translates into many areas of my life. And it just became very apparent to me that millions of women have done this before successfully and have not had issues. If you've been watching, you know that I take my ingredients very seriously, but there are three companies that I have found that I absolutely love. Check the description for discount codes. Hello, welcome to our show. My name is Adrian, and this is my guest, Rochelle, but I'm Rochelle's guest because we're just going to have a little chit chat today about primal birth, something that both of us did a little bit differently, I'm sure, but I'm really excited to share this with people because it's another, it's just like the carnivore diet in the way that your brain just kind of shifts your thinking about birth. And Rochelle, did you, you didn't have any hospital births, right? No, ma'am. I've only had one successful pregnancy and one successful home birth. So why don't you start then and tell us how did you decide, like, how brave of you? I had three, actually, I had four hospital births before my home birth. So I've tried both sides, and I'll tell you, the home birth was way better. But I wasn't brave enough. How did you make that decision? Well, Adrian, first of all, super excited to have this conversation with you. Second of all, I am not your typical person in that I don't like to do things that everybody else is doing. It's not you know, about doing fads or doing things differently. It's about, for me... I, I thought to myself, what did they do 100 years ago, 200 years ago? And this translates into many areas of my life. And it just became very apparent to me that millions of women have done this before successfully and have not had issues. And if they had had issues or potentially may have had issues, they had great support networks like doulas and midwives who are along for the journey that would be able to recognize things and mitigate any potential hazards because the last thing I wanted was to have C-sections. Now I'm not going to share someone else's story, but I, you know, in my family, my, my poor sister, she had to have C-sections. And I just, to me, that just was not something that I wanted. Obviously there were extenuating circumstances for why she had to have those, those cesareans, but it just wasn't what I wanted for me. And I wanted to do everything that I could from every single angle possible to mitigate the potential of me having to have a cesarean, not because I care about the scarring, not because I care about the vanity of like how my body would look after having gone through, you know, like a traumatic procedure like that, but just because I didn't want my baby to have to go through that. I didn't want my husband to have to go through that. I didn't want to have to go through that if I didn't have to. So it was just, it was very, a very simple decision for me. My husband is very, very supportive. I immediately went to him and said, look, when we have children, if the Lord provides us with children or an opportunity to have children, I want to do home birth. And most of the women that I was uh, fellowshipping with and associated with and that were friends of mine back home when I lived in Canada, all of them did natural births. They might have done it at a, a birthing center. Some of them would do it at home, but all of them did it naturally. And I was like, I want to do that. So I was leaning on them and their experiences and then using it for my own. And I'm really curious about you because you've had four. You bring up a really good point that just if people would just keep this in mind, the cesarean rate, if you go into the hospital, is so much higher than if you birth at home. So to me, that tells me that not all those C-sections are necessary. Because Correct. if there's a way to do it differently and the rate is significantly, and I couldn't tell you what the exact rate is, but I wanna say it's like what, one in three people going to the hospital these days are having a C-section, but if you home birth, it's maybe one in 20, one in 30. I mean, the, the magnitude is huge and I wish I could tell the exact numbers because that'd be really helpful. So I apologize about that, but guys, but so my thing was my first kid, and, and so I had all the issues with each pregnancy. So you, I had all the things where you're like, oh, of course you want to be at the hospital. Like my first kid, he was turned wrong. And so it was incredibly painful. And the epidural didn't work. He came out with a bruised cone head and it was very traumatizing. And we had issues from that birth on and that child, we've never put a label on it. We are working towards um, reducing inflammation, but some people would put labels on 
some of his symptoms. And he didn't talk until he was about five, and he didn't fully potty train until he was like eight or nine. And and see, and then he has all these sensory issues. And so after that first kid, I was like, wow, what happened? You know, I ate so healthy. I ate my vegetables and my meat. And I ate, I ate low carb. And mm -hmm. what happened? I was not the girl eating ice cream and pizza in my pregnancy. So then pregnancy number two, I, I get more healthy, take more supplements. And um, I end up with preeclampsia. And I get up to 330 pounds because I gained 60 pounds my last six weeks of water weight. So 10 pounds a week of water weight. Do you know how terrifying that is? Obviously, my body was going, ah. It was but serious. the doctors didn't have an answer. They said, that's just a fluke sometimes. That's just a fluke. Um, so we go to have baby number three, and we lose baby number three at 20 weeks. And so I'm like, Something's, something else is still not right, but still no answers. So baby number four, now I've got to tell you, baby number one and two are with husband number one. And um, baby number three, four, and five are with husband number two. Wonderful, wonderful husband number two. Thank you, Jesus, for husband number two. Uh, so I go into labor and it was precipitate. I wanted to have a natural birth, but I also was still too afraid to home birth. So I, I ended up staying home as long as I could, which turned out to be about five minutes. And then I was like, oh my gosh, he's turned wrong again just like the first baby so we rushed into the hospital and as i stepped out the door of the car my water broke and they hauled me up there and they were like okay it's time to push and it hurt so bad it was traumatizing so i'm all getting to baby number five which is Earthside baby number four and this one happens during the bad virus and we're hearing these rumors of if you catch the bad virus you get your baby taken away from you you might not be able to have family you might not be able to have your husband so and all those things were like or like maybe medications or injections would be pushed on us and i didn't want any of that and so that was my big push was number one a couple of my kids Earthside kid number three, so kid number four, he came out and he had tremors and they couldn't tell me why. So, and then, so we have these like mystery kind of illnesses and we can't find out why. And so my thought is, gosh, if I just strip away as much as I can, any people say it could be the cause of, if I just strip that all away, then we'll come to a root and maybe I'll have healthier babies. Another thing is all three of my babies so far up to baby number four had colic. And I was like, I cannot survive another colic. And then the next thing was I had drips of milk. That's it with all my babies. And it was, it didn't make any sense. I took all the supplements. I ate all the foods. I rested as much as I could. I, um, I, I had the pump, I had the lactation people. I went in, I went, I'm in very type A and this milk is just not coming. And so baby number four was, let's do it as natural as possible to see if we can have milk and no colic and please no illness. So that's what drove me. Yeah, so how did you find your doula or your midwife? Okay. Wait, 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 I need to ask you, were you successful? In having home birth? Yeah, like or was- in was what baby, way? Earthside baby number four, was that baby not four. colic? What, did your milk come in like you were successful? I He did not have colic. So that's huge. Yes, huge. And he was my sleepiest baby, my happiest baby. To this day, he is my healthiest, hands down, my healthiest baby. Developmentally, speech-wise, socially, um, he doesn't have any sensory issues, but I didn't get milk, which oh. is what led me. Here's a great part about a midwife, though, is that my midwife knew other very healthy women, and one of them had twins, and she had such an abundant supply that she was pumping it off just to relieve herself. So between me working my butt off and her, we were able to supply, this is the first baby that got breast milk for almost an entire year, nothing but breast milk. Oh. And so, so the midwife was more than just my partner and my helper and my teacher. She also helped me find this amazing gift. You know, I wanna just talk about breast milk for a second. There's this saying that goes around of, you can't tell which kid had formula when they're in kindergarten. That is a lie. And I, I, I hate to say it because I had to give my kids formula because I didn't have milk. I didn't know any other way. I didn't know 
And then we were told all formulas are the same because they're all approved by the government. Mm. They're not. They're not all the same. Yeah. And when you look at the ingredients now that we're carnivores and you look soy and canola oil and corn syrup, I mean, this is just inflammatory, toxic sludge. And, yes. then, and then we're like, well, the kid was born with that. No, uh -huh. we put them in an inflammatory state from birth. And this is not a judgment. My first three kids all had formula, all of them. So, because sometimes you don't have a choice. And I'd love at the end to talk about the low milk supply a little bit more, but into the, the, what is the difference and how did we get there? So I found this midwife and I just was very blessed that she was a Christian and that she was a good fit because I didn't know what I was doing. So I'm very blessed. And what she did was empower me. She gave me education I had never heard of or had access to in my entire life. And one of those pieces was, it's called 13 Moons and it's by Andy Birth. Andy birth, 13 moons. And people should give that to mothers instead of what to expect when you're expecting because it's so much juicier. It's so much more real. It's so much like what is the actual process happening with my body and how did they handle it throughout time? And and so we, we did things so differently. And I'll just keep going and then I'll let you tell us about yours. But like, I asked my midwife, I said, I have, I have a history of preeclampsia. I have a history of anemia. I have a history of being turned the wrong way. I have history of really painful birth. Will you still take me? And mm -hmm. she was like, absolutely. Yeah. She said, we're going to get ahead of these things instead of letting them fester, which is what the hospital system does. They don't pack anything until it's already there. Correct. And instead, we were proactive. So for anemia, I made sure she told me, to, and I wasn't a carnivore yet. I was very low carb, no chemical, no dairy, no grains, no sugar. That's mm -hmm. where I was at. So it was mostly meat and green beans. That's where I was when I got pregnant and during my pregnancy. So she said I needed to eat more eggs and more red meat, which I, I wasn't doing. I was eating chicken and fish. So yeah. that was a good one. And then she had a supplement that you can get. It's like heme something just to, oh, to keep on top of it. And I ended up not eating infusions. Yeah. And then for the preeclampsia, she said often, you know, that's a blood pressure and all that. And that can, she said that it was often a not enough salt. So she had me start putting element in my water, in my food. And as we go on, I am not a midwife and I may not speak everything that she said to me perfectly. So definitely reach out to a trusted midwife when you have these questions. And this is not medical advice. This is just my experience. So right. I added this salt. It was the first time going from preeclampsia and always super inflammatory. My previous pregnancies, I was a big puffball to no inflammation at all. Wow. I don't remember how much I gained during my pregnancy, but it was not bad. Um, wow. So we ahead of all things. And let me tell you, when I gave birth to Mommer, it was three long, I mean, okay, first of all, I'm very blessed, mm -hmm. but it was honestly not traumatizing at all. It was beautiful. It was so beautiful that it makes me want to have 12 kids because it was that beautiful to just get to have these three long contractions that every single one of them I was thanking God for. I was saying, thank you, God, for moving this along and for this beautiful experience, every one of them. And they were not horrible. There was one second when I said to myself, I don't know about this, but it was literally like one second. And then he was here in my arms and I didn't hemorrhage because one, there's so many things here, but like they say that a lot of the hemorrhaging is from the interventions that we do, the, mm -hmm. the massage, the, the forcing people saying, hey, you're out of 10, so start pushing. Well, yeah. I'm not actually ready no. because if my body was ready, the reflex would start. Mm. And I could just go on and on and on. I'm sure when you talk that more things will come up because I just feel so passionate about this that it was just the most. And then to just be able to get up and go sit in bed with my baby. And I got to tell you something. The baby came about three weeks early in a blizzard and my midwife got in a car accident on the way, but she had prepared me. She had prepared me and I did not feel scared at all. I felt grateful and excited and it was euphoric, honestly. So, okay, go ahead and tell me about your midwife, your experience, 
And did you run into any medical conditions and how hard did it hurt and all that? Okay. Before I, before I answer your questions, I want to share the statistics that you weren't sure about for percentages. So I looked it up while you were sharing because I, I'm a statistics person as well. I like to know my statistics if I'm going to share them. And this is only based on the USA. Different countries have different values. But in the US, if you are in a hospital giving birth, uh, the uh, cesarean rate is 24.7 for hospital births. That's how many hospital so births. one in four. Yeah, that's how many hospital births end in a cesarean. If you do a home birth, 5.3% end in a cesarean. That's a huge, huge like one, one in, fifth of that. One in 20 versus one in four. Yeah, that's pretty significant. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I'm really just... I just really want to share that information with people, not to scare them, not to say that the only reason that you would ever have to have a cesarean is, you know, because of being in a hospital. But I do want to say something that I learned is if you are in labor and you go to the hospital and you do not have the baby in a timely manner, whatever the hospital thinks is timely, uh, they will push you for a C-section because time is money for them. A lot of, not all hospitals are like this and I'm not making a blanket sweeping statement about the people who work in the hospitals, but just in my experience, uh, this is what I have learned, um, is that they will push you for a C-section because time is money and they can also charge your insurance more for the C-section because now it's a surgical pr procedure. Here are my thoughts on C-sections uh, in particular and, and doing everything I could to avoid it was, um, number one, they're numbing you from the waist down so you're not able to feel anything because who wants to feel a scalpel going through all of their muscle tissues. Number two, that is in your bloodstream. And so now it's in your infant's bloodstream. Number three, it's not natural. So mm -hmm. the baby's not squeezed as the baby is coming out there, cutting and removing the baby. Number four, you're not as aware of what is going on. And so I feel like your ability to advocate for yourself may not be um, as sharp unless, you know, your husband is there or your midwife or your doula and they're able to advocate for you. Uh, to make sure that, you know, if you're, if delayed clamping is a thing for you, because that was a thing for me, I wanted to make sure that I did delayed clamping because a third of my baby's blood was in the placenta and I needed it to finish going into my baby before I clamped the placenta off. There were just so many moving parts, not to mention the first thing your baby is seeing, because this will be the first time that your baby is opening their eyes and they're getting all of these fluorescent LED bright white lights, you know, people completely like in hazmat basically uh taking them out and you know if they don't if the baby doesn't do or act a certain way right away then you don't get the baby on your chest right away so you're not getting that immediate skin to skin there are this was like this was the process that went through my brain that was the nightmare that would have been the worst case scenario for me and that's the only reason why i'm sharing it is because and they say that bacteria oh sorry and they say the bacteria they need to be exposed to bacteria in your canal as well. You no, know, and I hadn't heard right? that. I'm not sure what that what that looks like or what that bacteria is, but it just makes sense to me that God designed us for this. And yes, sometimes there it is necessary to have medical intervention, but <clears throat> half the time I think the stress that uh, the stress that babies go into is because of the the medical system pushing mothers to do things that their bodies are just not ready to do birth is not something that just it's not a switch you can just turn it on and off for me and i have a whole youtube on this for me my birth started i went into prodormal labor after uh hand raking a 20 by 40 foot patch of dirt compact dirt and then sowing grass seeds because we had just moved into our new built built house and I was tired of looking at the dirt. I was like, I'm going to I'm gonna do some grass seeding. All my stuff was done. I'd already nested. I literally, dinner was on the stove. I had nothing left to do. I was bored. And I called my husband and I was like, what can I do? And he's like, well, you want to you do some grass seed? And I was like, yeah, he didn't tell me to rake. I chose to rake because I know that gardening is a process. Anyway, um, I put myself into what is known as prodormal labor. So it's like labor without being in labor that night. Within a few hours, I was like, ooh, ooh, this is happening. Uh, so we called the midwife, called my doula. They came. She checked me. I was three centimeters dilated. I was uh, having contractions every three, <coughs> excuse me, three to five minutes. And they were, I don't know, sorry, 
was it three to five minutes? Yeah, every three to five minutes, and they were lasting about a minute, and then they were every one to two minutes, and they were lasting about a minute. And I was like, this is really awesome. I'm so excited. My husband was over the moon. He went and set up the birthing tub and got everything ready, and, like, we prepared our bed and everything. Because, like you said, getting into bed with your baby afterwards is, like, the best thing ever. And so don't worry, I didn't get into my good sheets. I had um, a plastic sheet over the entirety of my bed made, and then I had... Uh, set an extra set of sheets over top of that plastic sheet so that way when I got into the bed none of my yicky stuff from the tub blood whatever would get on my sheets and yeah it was it was the hardest part for me of labor I would say would have been my water breaking that was when I really questioned myself and got humbled like can I really do this because I was thinking at just two hours prior to that I was like oh if this is all that labor is like I can handle this. And then I was like, okay, the contractions are apparently getting shorter. They don't feel like it. They're getting more intense. And then my water finally broke and I just felt so relieved. I was like, okay, like, is the baby out yet? <laughs> like, no, obviously the baby wasn't out yet. I didn't know what to do. Um, and then uh, I felt like I had to go to the washroom, which is a telltale sign that the baby is really ready to come out. My midwife wasn't there. My doula was there. Thankfully, she arrived just before my water broke. Um, and as soon as I sat down on the toilet to go to the bathroom, because I felt like I had to go, the urge to push came over me. And that is exactly what I know my body needed to have happen. You mentioned a helpful book to read, Ina May Gaskin's, uh, I think it's called Guide to Childbirth. My midwife recommended that I get that book and I ordered it. And I'm really glad that I did because for two weeks leading up to my birth, I read the birth stories in there. I started going through them when I would eat my breakfast. I would like read one or two of the birthing stories. Some of them make you laugh, some of them make you cry, and some of them make you go, Fuck. but <clears throat> it was helpful to know that there are so many variables. There are so many different things that you can experience when you're giving birth. Anything can happen. Literally anything can happen. And like how fast it happened from the time that my water broke to the time that my son arrived was uh, 35 minutes. My water broke. I started having the urge to push. I got in the tub um, just after one o'clock. I think it was like 1.15 p.m. or something. My midwife was still not there. Bless her heart. She was on her way, but she was still not there. Uh, and she arrived at 1.25. I started pushing around 1.30 and the baby was born at 1.55. Like it was fast. Um, and I attribute that to carnivore staying super, super active. Um, I was on weight restrictions because I was having a lot of pain just where he was sitting in my pelvis and, and like a little background story on me. I fell 16 feet and fractured my pelvis when I was 19. So like there were just some things that were just aching and very uncomfortable. So it made it so that I had to lighten my load when I was training, which was fine. Um, I did walk a lot, like at least one to three miles every single day. Uh, I had no preeclampsia. I had no issues with my iron. All of my blood levels were optimal. The only thing was at the very, very, very beginning of my pregnancy was my progesterone was a little bit suboptimal for me, given that I have a history of miscarriage. So I've had two miscarriages. And um, when I <clears throat> told my midwife that, because that was my concern, like you shared with your midwife, like, here's my laundry list of things that I need to know that you'll accept me if I have these things. Uh, my list was short, but the biggest thing for me was having the history of miscarriage and she was like, no problem. And, uh, when, when you're able to, like, I'm going to send you for a lab, you're going to go get your progesterone checked and, uh, we'll just make sure things are optimal. If not, I have some tricks up my sleeve. And literally I went and I gave her the number. It was 11. My, I don't know why I remember so vividly, but my progesterone was 11, which is optimal for many people, but for someone with a history of miscarriage, like myself, not optimal. She recommended uh, Vitex, which is chase tree extract to naturally boost my progesterone. And uh, she said I could get a cream as well. You know, those uh, progesterone creams that, that are made from like yam or whatever. Um, so I got both of those, started taking them both. And it, it didn't even take a week. And it got me into an optimal range. So it went from 11 to 16. And I had to stop taking the cream because it would make me really sick, like really, really sick. Uh, but I had no morning sickness. I had, I was barely, like I was tired at the end of the day, but I didn't have to nap during the day during my pregnancy. I had one bad day where I like, I had a cry, like a meltdown cry uh, because some things were going on that were just beyond my control. And I was just, I was just upset. And so I just cried about it. But other than that, it was a very smooth pregnancy. 
and very smooth delivery. And my baby boy is healthy. He is thriving. He is gorgeous. And like, I just, I'm just so grateful that God let me have that experience. Now, if that's not the experience that he gives me with the next one, I'll understand that, you know, there was something for me to learn or something he wants me to help other people with. But that's kind of where things were at for me. I think you'd ask me how I found my doula and my midwife. Uh, I found my doula through my midwife and I found my midwife through my former neighbor who just knew what kind of person I was. And she was like, I think you'd really like this midwife before I was even pregnant. I had a midwife. So it's like God started lining things up for me uh, before I got pregnant. And then, yeah, the rest is history. But I I would 10 out of 10 recommend both my doula and my midwife to anybody in my area. Like they are amazing women. Uh, And my midwife, I think she's delivered over 400 babies. And I'm just like, she's seen it all. She's seen it all. And I'm like, I'm just so grateful that I had someone like that who was willing to be honest with me and remind me who was in control. Um, I'm curious more about you, obviously, Adrian. Like, tell me more uh, about, you mentioned like um, milk and how, like how different your children are. Like, where do you want to go from here? You tell me. I want to talk about midwives for a second. I also asked around before asking this woman or, or interviewing her about it. And people knew where I was at. I didn't want a hospital birth at home. Some midwives... That's how they are. They will have your, they will ask you to get certain shots. They will pressure you into different interventions because their type of licensing or something like that requires them to do that. And I'm going to be honest, my midwife, I'm not even sure if it was like a a license through the state or not. She was a different kind where she could do what she wanted, but she had to be licensed of somewhat because she could run blood work. And and so another thing about my midwife was, like you just said, she ran a ton of blood work against my concerns. Okay, Mm -hmm. let's check into that. And it was like, what? You can run for this ahead of time? That was like never done before. Um, Another thing, I also had a super fast birth and I also watched. So the 13 Moons is actually an online course and it's housed in Mighty Networks. But you go to IndieBirth.org, something like that. And then you can look, Google Indie Birth. 13 moons. I just gifted it to a friend that I found out was pregnant. So I just did this. So you can gift it to other people. The the course does cost money, uh, but they put a lot of love and work into it. But in that course too are videos of other births. So you can watch different births. And the head lady who, who does this has, uh, she had 10 or 12 births. And it was the last one that took so long that she started getting concerned. So she actually went into the hospital. So it's true. Even the head midwife of all the midwives who created this amazing course, even her 12th one, she ended up going into the hospital. Now, after she moved, she relaxed enough that everything worked out and she didn't let anybody to touch her. So she still did her thing. But it just goes to show we don't always have control over those things. Correct. And you, Correct. you just don't know. One of the reasons I think that some home births go so much faster, they were explaining in their course, is because it's a very similar muscle as your butthole. I mean, try pooping in front of other people. How easy is that? How easy is it to poop in front of other people? It's not. Your butt goes, eh, I'll wait. (laughs) And the same thing happens with birth. You're in this sterile hospital room. You probably have your mom, your dad, your husband, a bunch of nurses coming in and out and a doctor and they're up in your area, which was another thing to talk about. I don't think that my midwife ever touched me ever. I don't know about you, but mine was very hands off to avoid any introducing any bacteria, introducing anything. And it just, there was no reason to check for those things, I yeah. guess. Yeah. I didn't have any spotting. I didn't have any weird pain. There was just no reason to do any of those checks. If, if I, so towards the end, unfortunately, I caught the bad virus and it was the bad one. You know, there's different variants. I got the bad one at the end of my pregnancy. And so at that time she was like, we're going to probably need, we're obviously going to a doctor to help you with that because I'm very concerned. And there were a lot of bad outcomes with pregnant women who contracted that. There was a point at the end of my pregnancy when they told me that I wasn't leaving, that they were going to 
they were waiting for a couple more numbers to drop and then I was probably going to end up on a, a ventilator and they were going to C-section the baby out. But at the same time, they wouldn't give me IVs. They wouldn't give me nebulizer. This should be thumbs down, thumbs up. I really wasn't getting home. I was getting sicker by the second because of the protocol. They wouldn't give me steroids, which was a, which I don't know how that works in pregnancy, but they said it wasn't part of the protocol, so they couldn't give it. To, they basically not giving me anything, so I left against their will. Now, I understand that I'm blessed and God took care of us, but we did find a different doctor that was able to help us. I got better just in time. And one of the things they said was there's absolutely no way. They told me there's absolutely no way you can give birth to this baby. You're going to hemorrhage. You need a C-section. And I had zero bleeding, which, again, I feel fortunate for. But I think part of that is all the work that was done. And a lot of that work, she was, my midwife follows Lily Nett, and And she writes all those books, Food for Pregnancy, Food for um, Fertility, Food for All the Things. And... Mm -hmm. um, so we had done a lot of work through nutrition. Nutrition was a huge piece of whole picture. I do have a question. Yes. Did you eat the placenta? No, I didn't. I'm actually using bovine placenta right now, but I thought about that, um, but I had heard somebody made a suggestion about taking your placenta and then buying a rose bush and then planting the placenta under the rose bush. And then I bought two rose bushes, forgot to put the placenta underneath it. Like, now it's still in my freezer. <laughs> I should probably. I love that. Yeah. Oh, you could still do it then. Well, the so rose I actually did. Now. And now, well, now you're going to have to plant an apple tree or something. Or yes. whatever trees grow in Texas. A crepe myrtle, which is basically. Uh, like avocados? Crepe myrtle, it's called. Ooh. Yeah, I did get mine encapsulated and I actually regret it. And this might not be an accurate thing to say, but I question if because of my virus, if it had gotten contaminated oh, with spike proteins. Oh, interesting. And I, I did take it and I ended up with long haulers, but maybe that's not a thing. And maybe that's a, maybe that's ignorance on my side because maybe it is. They said it looked absolutely gorgeous. I actually have pictures and I would love to share them one day because have you seen that documentary that Paul Saladino did and they show the placenta of a primarily plant eating person versus a meat eater and the meat eater is gorgeous and purple and the vegetarian is it's like literally calcified and white and terrible looking. So I really, really think that we should eat meat. Okay. Did you film your birth? No. Uh, part of me kind of wishes that I would have, but I feel like it's like it's filed away in my little Rolodex up here um, because it was such a sacred experience because it was the first experience. Like, I, I don't know if I would have been happy having someone film it. I know I could have because my my doula is a, a photographer as well, and she would have done an, an incredible job. I have no doubt about it. But I think because A, it happened so fast, and B, I, it was just so intense. I don't think I, I don't know. Do people do that? Is that a thing? Like, did you? Oh, I totally would have done it, except my baby was born in like tenants. That's fair. That's fair. So, yeah. No, I didn't get to, but I would love to. Totally separate subject, but did you watch The Business of Birth? No. That's another one just on, you know, how it all works. The birthing center is one of the number one money making for the whole hospital system. It's big bucks and you're basically forced to pay it every, you know, because you want to have, because you're, you want to have this healthy birth. And so you go and they charge a lot and it's a lot out of pocket and especially with the, the C-sections and then all the intervention the whole time, your whole pregnancy, you know, they're giving you scans and you're going to the doctor every month and then every week. And I checked in with my midwife a lot, but it was a, a lot less intervention, I think. Did you have? Yeah. Didn't miss anything, do you think? That's all right. I actually stayed at the hospital for the first 20 weeks. And I did that because I had a loss at 20 weeks. So I think I had two ultrasounds and I know people in the home birthing would go, Oh my gosh. Ah, but I weighed out having panic attacks and stress 
versus just knowing everything's fine. Another thing that was very strange with my baby, he did not kick very much. And so I, so I think I ended up having one ultrasound later on just because he did not kick. I mm. mean, he literally just didn't move around. And I thought that was so weird because my previous kid literally danced in there. I mean, music would come on and I'd start getting punched in the gut. So th those were the only, only things. And honestly, to this day, he's just a really calm guy. So I don't know about all. As a person who had a loss, I guess you should definitely pay attention to the movement of your baby. Oh, yeah. I definitely and I, wherever he was wedged. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He, well, which brings I... me to another thing. I asked my midwife, you know, what happens if the babies flip the wrong way, like my first baby? And she said, we have maneuvers for that. And yep. they're not 100%, but they're pretty darn good. And also she had me moving to make yeah. sure that I'm nice and stretched out and, and allowing the baby to wiggle into the right place. And he was because he just came off. Yeah, what do they call it? Baby spinning. Oh, There's a website, yeah. babyspinning.com, I think it is. And they have, like, when your baby is, like, sunny side up, so, like, facing outwards and breach, you know, they have different movements and techniques that moms, moms can do to turn the baby backwards and down, like head down or whatever way they're supposed to be facing. I don't, I don't know. But um, I was very fortunate in that my little man was head down from about 17 weeks onward. Like he was fine. And nice. it was, I loved it because like, and I still, I still, I can still feel it in my belly. Like when he gets his little feet going, like when he rubs his little feet together and like his little heels start going, I'm just like, Oh, I remember what that felt like in my belly. That's what you were doing when you're in there. And I just love it. <laughs> Cause he's like, he was very, like, he's a kicker and he's like, always gets his like little feet going and his like little heel jabs. It's just the cutest little thing. So every time I touch those little heels, I remember what they felt like on the other side of my belly skin and like just wondering what he was like what he would look like because I didn't do a single ultrasound I only had the Doppler one time um other than that I did not participate in anything except for what I had to do uh lab work wise with my midwife I as old school as possible as natural as possible that's what I did yeah for a third boy I want to tell you one more reason I didn't do it and this was really the driving factor I don't know what caused my baby's colic so I wanted everything to be as natural as possible with no disruption. We didn't even go to the doctor. I had the doctor come to us. We found a doctor that would come to our home. I had cranial sacral come to our home. I had lactation come to our home. I didn't leave our home. We were just so, my whole goal here was if we're undisturbed in every way possible, because we don't know what causes it, then it'll be a better outcome. And it was a better outcome. But I do think that the colic, I think that is from, my theory is that that is from antibiotics during pregnancy. I think that the antibiotics disrupt not only my gut flora, but baby's gut flora. And then when they come out, it's hard for them to digest anything because their gut flora is all off. That's my theory, but I don't know if that's true. Well, from what I've read and understood, understand that babies when they're born they don't have gut flora and that's why uh, breastfeeding is so critical for them because it helps to build their digestive tract and build their digestive tract flora and if you're in a situation like you were in where your hand is forced because your body's not producing any colostrum or milk and you have to supplement with formula you're unfortunately like your baby's body has to try and do it without the support of the mother's milk which is tough like it, to me uh any babies that I've ever seen with colic, it's usually related to diet, whether they're breastfed or uh, formula fed, because I've known, I've seen it in both, in both cases. Um, a lady that I used to nanny for, I love her so much. She has six babies and one of her little babies, she had eaten, I think it was like some sort of shellfish that had like a garlic, a really heavy garlic sauce. And the little dude was so gassy when I had him. He literally had like little man farts. The entire four hours that I was with him, I was like, how does such something so small smell so bad and have such like massive volumes of air coming out of him? Like, I couldn't believe it. But like, and he was fussy about it because obviously gas is very painful and they don't know those sensations yet. But 
it made sense to me like, oh, she had something that she doesn't normally eat, like this, whatever it was, shellfish, garlic shellfish, which is not something she would eat at home. Um, and that would contribute to the disruption in his system too, because it does pass through the breast milk. It could have something to do with antibiotics. I know at the, be uh, the beginning of my postpartum journey, I ended up with two, two ear infections, which I haven't had an ear infection since I was eight years old. Um, and I had to go on antibiotics for it, unfortunately, because they were so severe. Like there, she, the nurse basically told me either your eardrum ruptures and you let it heal for the next six months or you take the medication. And I was like, well, that's not a very, you know, positive spin on this. But I did notice that um, during that time, during the antibiotic period, my little man had diarrhea the whole time. And I, that was a side effect for me and for him. And that was the lesser of the two medications that they offered me. But still, it, it kills off all of the good and the bad. Um, and so your body has to like slowly rebuild that. But I think for me, and maybe this is true for you too, I find with carnivore, my ability to recover after having to take antibiotics, which is very, very, very rare, um, is much, much quicker. Do you think that that's the same for you? Or do you find that's the same for you? Praise the Lord. I haven't had to take a single antibiotic since going carnivore. But I use something else that I don't think we're allowed to say on YouTube. It I rhymes know. with, <laughs> yeah, it rhymes with eyes and divers. And, but I don't know. If, I haven't had an infection though, because that wouldn't be for an infection. That's for something else, you know. But any yeah. minor illness that I've had since carnivore, that's that's nipped it in the bud. Um, I would say obviously, if you have, because sometimes you have to have antibiotics you got to take them and then you got to take your probiotics and do the best to restore you can. Like this isn't like a pregnancy guilt of taking antibiotics. My problem was I was misdiagnosed. I was mm. told that I had bad, I had chronic bacteria vaginosis because I was having itch and it wasn't that at all. And so, so they would give it to me and give it to me and give it to me to the point my third child, Earthside, his teeth came rotten. And I have only recently found out that that can be because the teeth didn't form properly due to all the antibiotic. And what it turned out to be, if anybody has this incurable itch, is lichen sclerosis, lichen psoriasis. It's an autoimmune condition where your body's attacking its own skin. So okay. that has actually completely gone away with carnivore. But okay. if, if you have that and it hasn't, I got a solution for you. I'm like, when did it start for you? When did the itch start? And was it your whole body or was it just your lady parts like tell me more it can be your it, it could be anywhere on your body but it's very it's very common in the lady parts and the and the rear part and the okay. way that you know if you have it or not because there's big white patches like it's clearly white because one doctor i finally got the right doctor she took one look at it and goes you don't have bacteria vaginosis, you have lichen scoriasis. Like she took one look at it and she's like, this isn't bacteria, this is autoimmune because it's so white that you oh, can tell wow. that your body is attacking its own skin. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay, so basically what yeah. was happening so was- So a bunch of people body... are out there Googling right now. Right? So your body was attacking its skin and that, like the white, was it like the skin sloughing off or like what was the white, the white stuff? The white is just, if it's the same if you look up uh, the autoimmune, um, what is it, uh, Crohn's, is it? If you look up Crohn's, you'll see pictures of the intestine and that the pieces of the bot where the body's attacking the intestine are white because it's like dying off because your body's literally oh, trying yeah. to kill it. So the, the itch right is just, the itch is not, nothing comes off. It's just, and it oh, just hit the top of the Google search for the day. Like in sclerosis, yeah. you could save someone from taking an incredible amount of antibiotics and antifungals. And in people who have this type of autoimmune, when they take antifungals, it actually is really bad for their brain. And so not only are you being misdiagnosed, but you're hurting your brain mm -hmm. and your gut biome and your and leaky gut and all the things. So I hope people will go out and get informed on what this is because I had it for years years and I was misdiagnosed and I'm like, man, I'm just the dirtiest, grossest person. I don't understand. I shower every day. We clean our clothes every day. This doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Why oh. I have this chronic condition.
I was going to say, because I think this is really interesting because about two weeks prior to me giving birth, I ended up with what's known as the itch. Uh, and it's like, it's not a sexual thing or anything. It was literally just like the skin near my labia was so itchy and it was because of the estrogen plummeting as like the pregnancy was coming mm -hmm. to term. Um, and I'm eight and a half months postpartum and I'm still dealing with it. It's nowhere near what it was in the first four to six weeks, but I will say it's very frustrating. So shout out to all the women who don't want to talk about it, but I'm here to tell you that it will eventually go away. Uh, just be really gentle with yourself nourish that skin nourish your body moisturize the skin that is the most helpful thing because that's why it's so itchy is because the skin is so dry because our estrogen is so low and it has to be so low in order for progesterone or sorry prolactin to stay high um, but i just wanted to share that for anyone who might be struggling with that because that's something that i'm almost eight and a half months in and i'm still I still deal with it it's much much better i'm using homeopathic stuff and i use jojoba oil and coconut oil and everything but annoying and nobody wants to talk about it because it's kind of embarrassing that your labia is itchy. <laughs> I do want to say things that bring on lichen sclerosis so you might want to get a mirror and look down there <laughs> because I the looked, things that bring I, it on are pregnancy, puberty, and menopause. So it's a hormone switch that brings that often will kick people into this. But while we're at it talking about conditions, let's talk about low milk supply because this is something people just don't know about. People are convinced that if you just try hard enough, the milk will come. And it's just not true. If you have PCOS, endometriosis, diabetes, any autoimmune condition, Hashimoto's, adrenal issues, any of these things, your body is already struggling and it is likely to struggle to produce milk. And so there's all these people. I mean, I know for me, every single child, I tried harder and harder and harder to have this to the point I was pumping. The skin was falling off. I was getting infections. I wasn't sleeping because if you aren't, they say basically to nurse and then pump and nurse and pump and try to spread it out. And so you are trying to pull milk out of your body all hours of the day. And mm. of course you have the best milk production at night when you're supposed to be sleeping. And so I'm just killing myself trying to get this with all four children and it just didn't come. And then we finally ran some blood work that my doctors never ran when I went to the hospital system on immunity and my hormone levels. And that's when we found Hashimoto's and adrenal issues and hormone issues and cortisol issues and all kinds of things. And then it was like, oh, okay, this is why. And there's a group out there, IGT and low milk supply. So if you are thinking of getting pregnant or you're already pregnant, you're struggling with this, this is a fantastic group for answers. It's amazing. So that's my low milk supply spiel. Did you take like any that. supplements? I took earthly, earthly supplements. They're made out of, they're organic and, and wonderful. And even that. Yeah, I... Uh, have been very fortunate uh, and I like that you wanted to touch on this subject lastly because I think there's a lot more to it than just having an underlying autoimmune condition I think there is a silent epidemic of women particularly girls growing up and not developing the proper mammary tissues that they need in order to successfully breastfeed this I think is related to um, how depleting our food supply is, nutrient depleting our food supply is. I think it has, for many women, in my case probably as well, uh, was in relation to having low iodine in my system. I think that was a really big one. And uh, yeah, just like poor, poor, poor knowledge and understanding of what nutrients your body actually needs in order to properly develop. Um, you didn't hear about a lot of women having issues in like, you know, the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, but suddenly now we're in this like, you know, agricultural era where everybody's eating cereal for breakfast and, you know, boys are developing breasts, but girls aren't. Like there's clearly something mm -hmm. that's not working properly in society. Testosterone should be higher in boys, so they're not growing breasts and estrogen should be higher in girls, so they are growing breasts. I'm not saying that little girl should have breasts, but you know what I mean. I, I think you know what I'm trying to say. Yeah. That statement, but I think and that there's... The birth control. Yes. 
yes, that was my next thing was uh, hormonal influences, uh, not to mention drinking out of every plastic option possible, plastic cups, plastic water bottles, uh, plastic bottles in general, like people are being constantly exposed to like xenoestrogens and these microplastics, which mimic estrogen in the body and your body cannot detox from these things, or at least that's what they say right now is that your body cannot detox from these things. And it's like, if that's true, basically you're just plastic, plasticifying yourself <laughs> and preparing yourself for an early grave and infertility. And I'm not saying that that's true for all people, but as someone who was on birth control for way too long at the tender age of 12, uh, it wreaked havoc on my system. There was mm -hmm. a reason why I had so many issues getting pregnant. Yes. Well, I think this is a great topic to end for today, but I think this was so much fun. Yes, I think. Um, this is going to be posted to both of our channels. So please come like subscribe to both of our channels. And we hope you like this. If you guys have any questions or comments, please put them down below. We'd be happy to respond. I'm working on that. Busy moms. Yeah, it's just really primal birthing, I think, is the way to go, even though there's different ways to do it. All right. Thank you, everybody. 